Hi, welcome to Quok Talk. I'm Crystal here, breaking boundaries, continuing to transcend conversations around gender, culture, race, uh, everything. And, and, you know, today we're still celebrating kind of the uh, International Transgender Day of Visibility and also kind of the ongoing lack of visibility or kind of um, just, I think we, we, we need to normalize conversations around gender in different ways that actually embrace uh, cultural differences. And so I have a wonderful guest here who is an athlete, uh, a boundary breaker, uh, and a gender fluid advocate, um, a TEDx speaker, scholar, poet, but I love the professional bodybuilder aspect of this. So um, let me just welcome my wonderful guest, Siu Fong, Siu Fong Law. Um, welcome to Bok Talk. Yes, I'm so glad to be here. Hi, everyone. Um, so I understand you are at Emory right now. You're doing your PhD in the Women's Gender and Sexuality Program. Do you want to kick it off by just letting us know why and where, what, what areas are you studying and how this is relevant to your life and to our conversation? Yes, of course. So um, I came to America uh, three years ago um, in 2021. Hong Kong. Uh, yes, from Hong Kong to Emory. So I'm in Atlanta right now in the South. Um, and, uh, I take the program, uh, of like women's gender sexuality studies because I've always been very interested, you know, in topics in relation to gender. Um, I've been, you know, advocating and, uh, you know, on gender and gender fluidity in general, uh, when I was in Hong Kong and even when I'm in America right now. Um, and so I think, you know, this is a perfect program for me. Um, and I picked Emory, uh, because of very practical reasons because, you know, they, they, they gave me an offer. Of okay. Course. That's real. And they also yeah. allow me to, um, to work on, so my, you know, allow me to work on things that I love. Like, um, right now I'm, I'm in the process of, uh, preparing my prospectus, uh, for my, uh, for my oral defense. Um, so a prospectus is more like a proposal for your research, uh, for my dissertation after two years of coursework. Yeah. So, um, I am interested in particular thinking with uh, gender and sports, and in particular, thinking with, um, you know, now we, we call it a non-binary gender division in sports, yeah. especially in Asia, because a lot of conversation has been focused in America, especially, you know, on, you know, banning trans women athletes in sports okay. and sports. Um, and so I'm interested in something else. I'm interested in community sports events that have a non-binary gender category. Um, and in the arena of Asia. So uh, in particular, I look into bodybuilding because this is a sport I love. This is a sport I play. And this is a sport that I think has the potential to really transcend what we uh, typically think of gender and gender boundaries. Okay. So I want to talk about like the performance of the body in terms of, you know, your research and in terms of how the world perceives the body. Okay. So um, let's talk about, so let me just give you a little bit of background too. Um, cause I was at the university of Hawaii and I did my PhD in performance studies. And so I was looking into in between spaces, like, um, things, how do things perform? How does gender perform? Right. Um, how does the body perform and how does it embody history and culture? And so for you, you embody a very interesting mix of your Asian culture, you know, your Chinese culture. And the ideas of being gender fluid. And then you've got on top of that is this bodybuilding world that is a very niche world um, that is not for everyone. And it's a spectacle of the body. And yet people are judging you based on your pure physical appearance and performance and poses, which uh, determines uh, or maybe shapes the way we think about bodybuilders. I don't know. So c tell me a little bit about your in Hong Kong or in Asia generally, what are the kind of um, attitudes about bodybuilding? Is there kind of a, a tr growing trend in bodybuilding and what types of people tend to appreciate the sport? I think you asked the right person, really. Hey. <laughs> yeah. because, um, I'm not only a bodybuilder myself, I'm also a posing coach myself. So in fact, I was actually doing some posing section with some of my students um, in Hong Kong. So I, we were doing Zoom, basically. So yes, I had to agree that, you know, bodybuilding is a very, uh, you know, visual sport, but it's also a very aesthetic sport. So that's why I'm particularly drawn to this sport because it's so visual in the sense that you cannot escape from that visual spectacle aspect of it. 
Um, and I think, you know, if you ask me about the bodybuilding scene in general in Asia, it is uh, definitely a growing market, especially um, in China and also in India. Um, so I think, you know, these are the two places where bodybuilding is growing very fast, uh, especially with fans. So in terms of competitors, I think, um, you know, in general, there is just an increasing number of people getting involved in bodybuilding. And a lot of them were like primarily interested in fitness, you know, going to the gym, get fit. And I think we have this, uh, I mean, in Hong Kong or in Asia in general, there's a growing trend of, you know, you know, taking care of your health. Right, taking care of your body, uh, um, and uh, you know, COVID, you know, there's an increasing awareness of the importance of health and fitness, right? Yes, I think, uh, and, and especially, I think in Hong Kong, the most, you know, during COVID and slightly before COVID, there's also a changing, um, I would say, changing trend in terms of the fitness industry itself. So, uh, or previously, we have like large commercial gyms dominating the. And of dominating the gyms, you know, membership, you know, in, yeah. in general, in Hong yeah. Kong. Do you remember Dancing? California Fitness? Was that like one of the only gyms in Hong Kong? Long yes, it was one of the only. And I had been, you know, my first gym was at California. Okay. And, you know, and then it went down, right? And then it was replaced by a few other corporates, but it doesn't really work well. And I think that also changes. Like people mindset were like, you know, we won't, we don't want to be so, we don't want to be like, you know, uh, being, we don't want to be, uh, uh, to experience, you know, the, the, the hustling of people, you know, trying to sell you stuff, you yeah. know, um, and a lot of, it was, you know, very, uh, disturbing and annoying. Yeah. Um, so, uh, especially for people who are gender non-conforming, it's yeah. particular part. Um, I had an, a lot of encounters, you know, because of my gender. Uh, because of how I look, basically, because... Give me an uh, example. What does that mean? Like, I mean, was there assault? Is there just kind of a verbal abuse? Or is it just feeling uncomfortable, making making you feel like you shouldn't be here? Or what What do you mean? Yeah, all of the above, I okay. would say. Yeah, so, I mean, you mentioned about my TED Talk. My TED Talk actually did mention about some of these experiences in the changing room. Of course, like, I look into a more, like, a more transformative, positive experience. But it was the... Hearing. Which changing room were you at at that time? Which, which, I, because I don't know your transition process. So kind of give me a little background of that. Yes, of course. So I'm assigned female at birth. Um, and then I, um, I do not, I did not do any types of surgery and I have no desire to do any surgeries. Um, and I, uh, I would say I identified as a non-binary person or gender fluid, uh, meaning that I don't really particularly see myself within the gender binary of male and female. But I'm socially more, um, I would say, masculine. So, you know, on a daily social basis, people tend to perceive me as a man. Uh, but I, when I compete, I compete in the women's. So, um, yeah. So when I go to the change, so it's also very interesting because uh -huh. uh, when I was in Hong Kong, uh, mostly because of practical reasons, because the bodybuilding community uh, knew about me as a female bodybuilder. So I would go to male changing rooms, but you can also imagine because of how I look, you know, in terms of my muscularity, well, I didn't grow my beard at that time. So, you know, but still, you know, being very muscular and look like a guy, uh, yeah. going to changing room is a disaster for me. <laughs> um, yeah. But if you especially like in the changing room, most people are, you know, where they are just typical, you know, gym goers. A lot of them are auntie. They yeah, have no yeah, idea. Yeah. I've never seen, they're not in the bodybuilding scene, so they never see people like myself. Right. Like, you know, I've never seen a muscular woman in their life. You okay, know? right. And so I think that's the, that's when, you know, a lot of this um, uh, stigmas come in, you know, uh, when you ask me what are the, what were the experiences, all of the, you know, negative experiences that you can imagine, I had some sort of experience, like people would shout at me, like women would shout at me, scream at me, call police, uh, you know, they would open my curtain when I shower. Does it change who I am? Yeah. And uh, when I wear a sport bra, they would say, your, your breast is not real. You are, you are, you are, you have a man's chest, you know? Even when I was wearing, obviously, a sports bra and shorts. Yeah. Um, and I also had staff, you know, uh, being very rude to me, um, you know, multiple times. Yeah. Uh, as parents, they know who I am, but they try to be me. But sometimes they don't know about me at all. And they, I have been banned membership. I were, uh, there were ones that... Wait, you were banned a membership because of your gender or because they thought you were uh, abusing the rules of the club? 
Well, of course, they won't say very clearly. So that was this was this time when I was trying to um, uh, go to a new gym. So I want to get a membership at a new gym where I, which I very I like it a lot. Yeah. So I went there once. You know, I just wear I make sure I wear feminine. You know, like wear all the sports bra. You know, the female whatever. You know, vast. You know, pink color. You know. Um, make sure people know that I'm a woman. Um, it's funny you have to use that to perform what you think how you're going to fit into society, though, right? Yes, but it doesn't always work. Uh, so that time, I um, I do everything I think you know to make me look like a woman more. Right. Um, then I was there for a trial, and then I I was like, I love the gym. I want to you know I want to be a member of it. And then you know some of these staff were like, you know, they tell me under the table. They don't even tell me in the face. That's so they tell me for Chinese, though, right? Yeah, yeah. So they they told they told my coach that if I want to sign up for this gym, I need to wear long sleeves. I need to wear everything long sleeves to cover. That would not go down. Yeah, everything is so discriminating. Yeah, they, they, yeah, they would be in so much trouble. Exactly. And they were like, you know, their reason was like because I'm too muscular that I would be intimidating their personal coaches. <laughs> okay. <laughs> A gender reason because that was, you know obviously a gender discrimination yeah right what I did like, wow you know I was like mm, I, I I don't I'm not gonna do this gym so I would just yeah. go to a gym that welcomes me and right. fortunately I had another gym at that time um and he was you know the gym I told the gym owner the first time I went there all my situation I look I know I look like a guy but I go to the female changing room are you okay with that you know like and then he put it out in the front yeah right. Yeah, then he was a, you know, he is also a, he, he doesn't compete, but he's a bodybuilder himself. And so he was like, of course, you know, I'm very really welcome you. And a lot of times he defend me when people were, you know, pen about my, my, my presence in the changing room. Yeah. So it, it all boils down to being able to find a place that welcomes you and respects you, you know, as but an then there's a lot of blurry space with that because then it's not everybody who has these certain binary, very specific black and white views. Can I go back to the idea of, the, the performance space, um, because you mentioned that you perform, I mean, you p compete as, as a woman, um, but you identify as non-binary or gender fluid. Um, and I don't know, I'm sure you're aware of that film, Changing the Games, which came out in 2019 about these high school sports um, athletes. And they follow three different high school uh, trans kids who compete in sports and the whole controversy. And of course, this is the U.S., right? So you mentioned earlier that in the U.S., there's a lot of talk about who can compete where. If you were assigned that gender, you should be competing in that. But so here's the blurriness, right? You are technically female with female body parts, so you can uh, enter in the female category. But is there any pushback with all those competing, you know, requirements about where the hormones take place because you know in, even in like olympic sports hormones is not something that is accepted right yeah that's a really good question um so first of all i would say bodybuilding is such a different sport so i think it's one of the reason why it is not an olympic sport it tried to be an olympic sport it never really succeeded because basically everyone even you know um uh, elite women bodybuilders they all use steroids to a certain extent that's true. so we you know uh, female bodybuilders you know in order to get to that competitive level everyone uses testosterone and steroids to a different extent oh. and i think uh, more recently the whole bodybuilding community the elite bodybuilding community are much more open with really talking about steroids especially men women is still kind of a stigma but even, you know, and so a lot of times you see women, you know, when you say performing, a lot of times women bodybuilders, the muscular they are, the, the more they try to look feminine. Like, you know, they would go to the extent of doing breast implants and laser removal so that they would never grow hair, you know, or face or wherever. And they would also do breast implants because, you know, we train so much with our chest that it turns the fat into muscles. So we don't, lo we don't no longer have those fat tissues around our brain, right? So... Um, they would do like breast implants so that they would look more feminine. Um, they would always, you know, they would do nails. Like I never do nails when I get to the gym because it would just break off. But I don't know how they can do it. But they they get heavy with the long nails. Yeah. So for all these things, right? And they would wear makeup, make sure they yeah. wear makeup. And yeah. That's so that's a lot of like performance and yeah. I think anxiety around muscularity because muscularity is often seen as you know a a a virtue of like masculinity. 
And I think female mm-hmm. bodybuilders are actually breaking that boundaries itself, even though they try to perform femininity, right? They're trying to break that, you know, that stereotype that, you know, muscularity has to be associated with masculinity. That's, but a, great, oh, that's a great point. And, and I think how do we break those? Um, so who defines why, how the feminine is feminine and the masculine is the masculine, right? You know, who, who built these structures that were um, trying to work our lives within and how do we break those boundaries? And you're saying that, you know, bodybuilding is that space that really kind of transcends the defining categories in a, in a very strange way. Yeah, but I, thought, I mean, I think my, also my research, uh, I, I'm also not looking into what transcends. I think it's always very, um, it's very contradictory. I think sport itself is very contradictory. On one hand, you know, it really allows women to be muscular. That Our sport allows women to be muscular and really um, <clears throat> break through kind of the human limits of what we think a female body could do. But at the same time, our bodybuilding competition itself is very regulatory, right? It has a very strict, like women have to wear bikini, uh, women has to wear makeup, uh, women has to showcase their, what we call a femininity package. So do you uh, think that's sexist in itself, those, those regulatory established roles? Do, do you think there's sex- a really good question? Um, I, don't, I don't see it from a sexist perspective. Um, I see it as more of, um, for me, it's an experiment. Like, you know, I have been a very, um, I've seen, I mean, I see myself as a pretty masculine person. Like, I'm more, um, even though I don't necessarily see myself as a man in general, um, but I, I know people perceive me as a man in, in, in a daily, on a daily life basis. So why, I'm sorry, why do you compete in the woman's um, category then and not the men? Yes, because I don't identify as a man as okay. well. Okay. Right. So, uh, but I, I know I look like a man because of my muscles. Right. And because I don't necessarily like to wear makeup every day. Right. right. For uh, the performance of that competition, right? Uh huh. I mean, I love, but I really enjoy performing femininity on stage. Hmm. So, I think that is something that really, I mean, once I experienced that, uh, at first, I didn't know whether I like it or not. But once I experienced that, I was like, I really enjoyed that. But it doesn't mean that I wanted to do, I want to do it every day. But that's like, so ironic. You know, so you're saying performing femininity on stage, and yet it's through a bodybuilding competition, which is kind of really contradicting. You know, you know, like you said, the masculinity and the muscularity, that kind of relationship is really on display. But yeah, I think it's much more complicated, right? So, I mean, even scholars actually look into female bodybuilding. They would always say it's very paradoxical. It's mm-hmm. a very paradoxical sport. It's a sport where, you know, women can be however big they are, you know, and kind of defy that um, the, the notion that, you know, muscularity has to associate with masculinity. Right. But at the same time, we are also contradicting ourselves by, you know, performing femininity. Right. So I you know, I think that, I, but I think the contradiction itself is actually the best thing. Yeah. You no, know, I, I love it. Think it's not going to be just always, you know, towards liberation, you know. We're not always moving, you know, from a very liberal, progressive way. We move back and forth, right? It's the fluidity you're talking about, right? Um, yes, yes. That movement, I think, you know, it's like really moving, you know. Back and forth, this and that, you know, um, and I think that is the beauty of it. Yeah. And um, we're resisting binaries. And that's the whole thing about gender, women and sexuality studies is acknowledging that we have a multiple perspective and multi layers in our existence that we don't have to reduce ourselves to one or the other. Right. Which is something mm-hmm. that society has kind of taught us wrongly, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, 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 t- I, I entirely embrace the notion that we are very multiple. And then uh, we are very contextual, right? In a very, from a very practical concern, uh, you know, especially for example in the U.S., I feel safer being and being seen as an Asian man than an, an Asian, sure, right? And to say an Asian muscular woman, right, that would even create even more, um, you know, danger for me. So you know, it's a very practical concern on you know how why I should look like how I look like. Right. So I think it's, uh, it's very contextual, right? So it's not just like, okay, uh, it's not just, I think, you know, sometimes our idea about gender identity that I feel like I am something, it's a, it's a little bit too simplistic, 
right? I think we are more multiple and there are a lot of practical concerns, right? The practical concern about safety, about being, especially I think in the, you know, in the U.S., um, you know, be, being seen as an Asian woman, you know, an Asian muscular woman is very, could be very dangerous, especially with... Good point, because you're bringing out the kind of the existing reality of the violence against um, trans bodies in the U.S., which is, you know, increasing, um, but also bringing the attention to the idea of performing gender um, that, you know, we put on clothes, not just for who we identify with, but your your point is we actually have to kind of um, be aware and conscious of how we're being perceived in certain societies, really just for the safety reason too, and acceptance. Yeah, and it, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's for acceptance, right? So for me, because I look muscular and uh, I think, you know, uh, that's an also this aspect of like, you know, where we talk about intersectionality, right? This aspect of race was never really an issue when I was in Hong Kong because, you know, that was not really something that, you know, we concern about. Uh, but then when I'm in America, like there's always a famous saying to say, you only become a person of color when you enter America. It's and and I'll, I didn't feel that way when I was in Hong Kong until I moved back. Yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, I, and I have more concerns, right? You know, especially, you know, with the, all the COVID, right? The, the whole, the, the whole COVID oh, and all that, yeah. Right? How people see Asian bodies and Asian people in general. Yeah. And yeah. so I think, you know, that is this, you know, very practical concern here about safety, about survival. And, you know, uh, I mean, honestly, in a gym setting, which is very masculine and heteromasculine space, um, if you are seen, if you're being perceived as a man, it's easy. I mean, I think at least it you, it does it erases a lot of um you can say heterosexist cases uh, mm -hmm. from at the because I can see you know some of uh, some of these Asian uh, Asian women friends of mine that you know when they're at the gym you know that they're very conscious of them being women because you know being a woman you know and surrounded in a very masculine space they have to perform in a certain way mm -hmm. but you know because I can be very comfortable being you know seen as a man. And, you know, go, I mean, in America, I go to the male's changing room because, you know, uh, no one cares. <laughs> and, and then it's just easier because I'm yeah, not like... It's liberating, yeah, yeah. And so for that, you know, it actually, you know, takes me, uh, takes away that kind of anxiety that I would feel gym, you know, being gay as a woman, yeah. right? And I can just work out much more, concentrate, much more focus to my training itself. That's great. So, can we you know, go back? Sorry, I mean, because I, I know we're not, we're going to run out of time in a few minutes, but going back to your Hong Kong time, when you were bodybuilding there, um, can you also discuss or share a little bit more about your uh, family context? Like how did your family um, treat you and, and what, what your transition process and how much the Hong Kong society or cultural uh, stigmas with the rooted patriarchal Chinese kind of system kind of informed how you had to navigate, you know, your process? Yeah. Um. So my uh my parents were very against me when I first started bodybuilding. When was that? Um. That was around like 2014. So around 10 years ago. Okay. When I first started bodybuilding, and so uh at that time uh I never okay so I never came out as a trans or as a non-binary person at all. Uh. I mean, in fact, I never really came out as a lesbian when I was younger too. Like is that Did you is, date is boys that... or girls when you were growing up? Um, I mostly did. Yeah, you so, did. but I'm pansexual. Um, so in Hong Kong, I usually date women. Mm -hmm. So I would bring women, you know, I would bring girlfriends home and that's my friend, you know. But then, you know, directly, your parents, can you do, they kind of they know, know, kind yeah. of know that you're not going to change in a city per se. Yeah. And so, um, so, but then it never really come out. So I think, you know, the coming out story, the coming out context, a lot of time for me is very Western. It's a very Western idea. I think in eight, context a lot of times you know people just you know your parents just slowly know and they don't necessarily have to say that out okay. and never really say it out so um they see they saw news and stuff about me and they start to get it what's going on with me um and so my mom at the first, at the very beginning she was very against me doing bodybuilding she always tell me that you know muscles on women are very ugly and then she would you know try to pers con you know uh, try to persuade all our relatives that I'm ugly because of the muscles <laughs> so that, you know, they kind of would probably would, you know, I don't know, give some pressure on me, yeah. uh, which didn't really work. Um, yeah. And so, um, but, but then my mom was the, actually my first family member who actually came to my uh, competition. And after the competition, she actually, 
I mean, I get fourth in that competition. And I, th- I just still remember, you know, very vividly, like the first thing she saw me and told me at backstage was like, I think you should win because you are the most muscular woman on stage. Aww. So I think it, she accepted me, uh, you know, after she had see, she saw me yeah. on, uh, on stage and compete. And she never really complained about my muscles anymore. <laughs> uh, she kind of knew that I was to change. You know, she just, you know, make sure, you know, I eat well and my parents and my family. That's what a parent wants, right? To be healthy and happy. But were you taking hormones for your gender identity or, or were you taking on, on top of steroids? Like, how does that, are they similar? Are they, you know, how does that work? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I started with like steroids and the testosterone because of bodybuilding. Okay. Um, and, and I mean, I mean, of course they're overlapping. So, you know, I yeah. also do it. And that, um, so I would say, um, a lot of times like trans people, if they take, uh, if, uh, if they transition from female to male. A lot of times they take testosterone and they usually take uh, even testosterone. There are multiple types. Right. They're sh- lasting, long lasting ones. It means how long is they going to stay in your body. And they will have different effects on you when you are, um, whether you're, you, when you're building muscles. Okay. So the long lasting one are usually for ones to, you know, to bulk and build muscle for long term. The shorter ter- shorter uh, kind of testosterone will be used for cutting, where we are cutting and ready get on, to ready to get on stage. And on top of that, like bodybuilding has different types of other steroids. Some help you to make you more vascular. Some help you to make your muscle look harder. Some make your skin, you know, have some are like fat losing stuff. So there are different combinations requires really, you know, knowledge about that. You need to have a coach who really understand the world, especially women's body. Because women's and men's, each, even though we are trying to tell about gender fluidity, um, biologically, we also have a slightly different structure, right? Men and women or whatever bodies. And so you have to have someone who is knowledgeable enough to be able to help you with, you know, you are not using the yeah. same dosage as everyone else. You, yeah, know, you should be. So how did it um, affect you uh, in your, um, I guess, female physical body? Like, did you, when did you stop menstruating at a certain point because of even the steroids? Or is that the more the testosterone things that affect that? I think both, right? So a lot of like women competitors who never use testosterone, some never use testosterone, but they would use other types of fat losing, uh, whatever chemicals, whatever that is. And when their body, and also when they're, even if they're natural, meaning that they don't use any steroids, uh, at a certain point, when your body fat is very low, your body stops menstruating. It's almost like a fight or flight mm-hmm. mode where your body stops working anything extra for them. So um, it would also happen. So, you know, the, 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 the menstruation and uh, basically, yes, the menstruation itself, it will actually, you know, happen in all types of women, whether they use uh, testosterone or not. But typically, if you have been using testosterone continuously for a short period of time, few ones usually, then a lot of people would actually start menstruating. Mm, mm, okay. So, um, so that's a lot of like scientific kind of physical things, but to just bring it back to really the, there are beginning uh, conversation about the performance of the body, the spectacle of bodybuilding. Um, what would you have to say to our listeners about, you know, breaking boundaries in their own sense? Like, you know, a lot of people maybe are um, deprived of certain activities because of social pressures or maybe feeling not comfortable in their own body you know what are some of your um, tips or suggestions and how to embrace your body and to go for what it is that you're meant to do um i think there are two things right first of all is to trust your instinct you know if you see something if you see like i was first inspired by a female power lifter when i was 15 i saw randomly on the news and i was like that's it i want to be like her one day and I trust my instinct, you know, even though it take me almost five, five more years before I really start bodybuilding, I always wanted to do bodybuilding. There are different stuff happening that I cannot. So I do marathon running, I do rowing, I do dragon boating. I realized that my passion was really on bodybuilding. So if I trust my instinct 10 years later, it would be a very different story. So I think, you know, trust your instinct is always very useful. Um, the other thing, the other point is a little bit cliche, but I would say, you know, really, when you, once you know who you are, just be, be, just be yourself. You know, it's hard given the societal constrictions and everything. Um, but you know, uh, to, but then don't remember that, you know, you are never the only one and you are not the first one. Yeah. So there will all be people who were before you, who has been, you know, 
suffering in a much more you know, bad conditions. And yeah, they were able to flourish. So you will be able to do that too. So I think that are the two, you know, mottos for me. <laughs> when I'm yeah, down, struggling. We needed to hear that. And I think, you know, from an Asian context, struggling with a lot of kind of cultural stigmas and pressures from family, we needed to hear that from you because you're, you are living that, that success now, you know, and we wish you all the luck in your, the pursuit of your PhD, your continual um, advocacy for gender fluidity, um, and just everything about how you embrace life and bringing in the creative, the physical, the academic, the poetic, everything that you embody. So thank you so much. This is Sue Fong Law chiming in all the way from um, Atlanta. Atlanta? Yeah. Right? Atlanta. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And thank you so much for having me here. Thank you. That was amazing. liked this show, why don't you give us a like or subscribe to our channel. Thanks so much.